He's a skilled assassin between the ropes. A boxer's mind in a bruiser's body. Let us put a bit of challenge and a threat for any heavyweight champion in history. His talent is unquestioned. His life, the subject of constant speculation. He's not gay. They had this thing that he wasn't British. Except when it counts. The undisputed heavyweight. The world's dominant heavyweight began life as a bully, but he met his match at age 17. Tyson just turned into an animal. Lennox became a man on a mission. He said he and I are going to be champions and we're going to meet. The journey would be the most bizarre in boxing history. He's crying in his corner. I've never seen him. I couldn't believe what I was watching. He would emerge as a gentleman among brutes and buffoons. Tyson is the last misfit in heavyweight boxing. The man who destroyed the myth. This is Lennox Lewis. Beyond the glory. A decade into his professional career, Lennox Lewis seemed to have it all. A championship belt. Heavyweight champion of the world! A heavyweight bank account. A near flawless record. But 31 wins had failed to earn him boxing's greatest reward. Respect. In every era, there's supposed to be like two boxers that's supposed to really meet. I'm Dolly Joe Fraser. Me and Riddick Bo were supposed to meet. Me and Tyson were supposed to meet. These are the boxers in my era. After being ducked by two of boxing's biggest names, Lewis got his shot at greatness. Evander Holyfield had beaten Bo. He'd beaten Tyson. Twice. Madison Square Garden, March 24th, 1999. Only three men left in the ring. One fight to define a career. One chance at a lasting legacy. Lennox dominated one of the legends of the game, only to suffer at the hands of the judges. Disbelief, disarray. I just couldn't believe that that could happen. That is, ladies and gentlemen, a travesty, an outrage, a highway robbery. The draw left Holyfield the world champion, but the fight earned Lewis more respect in and out of the ring than he had ever won in victory. When they ask who the best heavyweight in the world, doesn't matter who's got the belt, they're going to say Lennox Lewis. In a sport notorious for corruption and unsavory characters, Lennox Claudius Lewis has long been the exception. A man of character, courageous in the ring, cautious and calculating in real life. Born in England in 1965, Lennox was a fighter from the very beginning. He was very easy. Maybe to pick a fight, you know? Like if he has a toy and some other kids take it away from him, he likes to fight. He grew up in London's tough East End, playing soccer with his half-brother, Dennis. Their mother, Violet, worked nights as a nurse and spent her days trying to discipline two budding hooligans. He's always... Um, worried about her boys. She had issues, but I didn't understand them at that, at that time. Violet had emigrated from Jamaica as a young girl. In London, she had two boys from two failed relationships. Lennox's father was a married man who had lied about his other life. By the time Lennox was seven, the single mom was at her breaking point. She made a, a very important decision to uh, go to America and look for a better life. 
She left the boys in London with family to look for work in Chicago. On the advice of a friend, she landed a factory job north of the border in Kitchener, Ontario, outside of Toronto. She sent for her youngest son, but the reunion would be short and painful. The money that I have, it was running out, so I told him that I have to send him back for a little while. It wasn't a situation where I was angry, it was a situation where I was just waiting for it to come back. It was hard, very hard. Today, Lennox is recognized outside the ring as a gentleman, gracious and reserved. As a child from a broken home, he was often violent and angry at the world. For five years, little Lennox bounced around English boarding schools, beating up classmates. He was been with a lot of rough kids. If any of the other kids would bother me, I was like the strongest kid. You know, I used to always fight in that sense. By the time Lennox turned 13, his mother had secured enough money to bring him back to Canada. He was a junior high student with a very short fuse. His size and Cockney accent set him apart. They would tease me, and I would get fed up with it. Often there were fisticuffs, and Lennox was usually involved with that sort of thing. He was a schoolyard bully, an outsider, and a loner in desperate need of discipline and attention. I suggested that maybe he should give some thought to uh, joining the, the Kitchener Police uh, Boxing Boys Boxing Club. When I went there, it was more like a fun thing. You know, we got to fight for free with gloves on and try and beat somebody up. The experience would transform him, but it wasn't the boxing. <laughs> That day, he met the man who would become the greatest influence of his life. I guess I uh, appeared to be a uh, father figure that he wanted, or whatever it was, but he stuck to me, and I was uh, very grateful for that. Arnie Beam would start Lennox down the path to glory. Lennox began spending all his time at the gym Beam managed. His mother was wary of her son's newfound passion and new best friend. At first, I didn't like the boxing at all. She wasn't excited with that or with me, for that matter. He was late coming home, never phoned. So I packed his bag, tell him to go live with Arnie. Arnie bring him back. <laughs> Beam's influence extended far beyond the gym. Soon, Lennox stopped throwing punches at school and started making friends. His natural athletic ability commanded respect. He's a phenomenal basketball player. He's so big and tall. He's at least seven, eight inches taller than everyone at that same age. He was a running back, and uh, he also played defensive end. You know what? I think if he wanted to be a great hockey player, he could have been one too. But for Lennox, who had spent years fighting and fending for himself, the boxing ring held an intoxicating allure. There was something about it that I liked. It was just you. To become a legend, a boxer must trade punches with the best of his generation. Lennox would face his greatest rival long before pay-per-view, pre-fight brawls, and the promise of millions of dollars. Training with Tyson was, was interesting. Tyson just turned into an animal. He was quite fierce. He would become Great Britain's best boxer in more than a century. But Lennox Lewis learned the sweet science far from London's hallowed halls where boxing was born. The troubled teen came of age in Canada under the tutelage of a part-time boxing instructor named Arnie Beam. There are a lot of people who told me I'm wasting my time and that he's not, not motivated and so on, but they didn't see the man that I saw. I saw will to win all of the qualities of a, of a champion. Lennox fought for three years without ever tasting defeat. His schoolmates became sparring partners. They could not believe his progress. He beat me to the point where I was seeing stars. I never thought he could ever do that to me, you know? By age 15, he was a Golden Gloves champ. 
The boxers in his age group were no match for Lennox, so Arnie moved him up in class. His first opponent was an 18-year-old named Donovan Razor Ruddock. That's the first time I fought somebody as big as me. Razor just manhandled him, and, and, and that was frustrating to him. The fight was close, but Lennox took the loss. He considered throwing in the towel. He said, I'm not going back. So, okay. The next night, he was back in the gym. Boxing had given Lennox a brand new identity. By high school, he was a star athlete. His newfound confidence caught the eye of a cheerleader from a rival school named Marcia Miller. You know, she would be a cheerleader for their side, and then I would score a point or something, she would cheer for me. I really fancied her back then. Marcia became an anchor in his life as he began chasing the dream of every amateur athlete, Olympic gold. By his senior year, Lennox was rated the world's best boxer under the age of 20. But his trainer, Arnie Beam, knew Lennox needed another test. Arnie was trying to get uh, a good sparring partner. We couldn't find anywhere, but we heard about this guy in New York. He couldn't find sparring partners. Legendary trainer Cus D'Amato was touting a 17-year-old street brawler named Mike Tyson. Tyson just turned into an animal. He could throw a hard punch, and he, and he just comes at you, and he's just always throwing punches, trying to trying to knock you out with either hand. And he just came back to the corner, his nose is bleeding, and I'm waving him down, and I said, you know, we don't have to go on with this. We can spar again tomorrow. He said, oh, no. I know what to do now. <laughs> it was a lesson that would become a Lennox trademark, adapting to an opponent's style in order to win. By the end of three or four days of sparring, he had Mike frustrated and under control. And he came back and he had all these pictures. He said, his trainer, Customato, told me that we are going to fight for the world title one day. He and I are going to be champions and we're going to meet. The sparring sessions in New York had Lennox Prime for Los Angeles, site of the 84 Olympic Games. British born of Jamaican descent, he would fight for his adopted home, Canada. 19 year old Lennox survived a standing eight count in his first fight, but he would lose to the eventual gold medalist, American Terrell Biggs. Lennox showed me in that fight that he had more heart than Tyler Biggs. The only thing that pulled Tyler Biggs through that fight was his experience. Even in defeat, Lennox and Arnie had served notice to the heavyweight division. They returned to Canada and were besieged by big money offers from professional boxing promoters. One thing you know about Lennox, he doesn't make any moves without calculating the gains. At that point, I was taking chess real serious, so, you know, that kind of helped me as far as the, what, what I wanted to do and what I wanted to achieve. At 19, he developed a long-range plan for his life. His only concern was for his mother, Violet. He said, but you need the money. I said, no. And I said, if you want to go to the other Olympic, you have to make it. Don't turn pro, and he didn't. Money was scarce. But we had the determination of, okay, you, went, you go there, you win the gold medal, everything will be all right. In 1986, with Arnie at his side, Lennox won gold at the prestigious Commonwealth Games in Great Britain. It was his first trip to London in nearly a decade. He, you know, made it a point of coming to visit and finding where I am. You know, we were blood. Lennox would remain close with his half-brother Dennis to this day. But there would be another reunion on this trip. Lennox sought out his biological father and met him on the streets of London. We spoke for a little while, took a little walk. You know, that was basically it. I said, well, what was it like, Lennox? What was what like? I said, well, you haven't seen your father in ten years. There had to be some kind of... A... Actually, Arnie, that man could never be the father to me that you had been. 
I stopped my tears to my eyes, you know. What alcohol does to you, and I've actually seen only in different states, you know, sometimes past, I don't even know who you are or whatever. So I realized that this this is serious. By 1987, Lennox Lewis was a full-time boxer, although still an amateur. He had turned down heavyweight dollars to turn pro for one more shot at Olympic gold. I came so close the first time in 84 in the Olympics, I realized, boy, this is four years later. I should be able to win. There's nobody that should be able to step in my way. This time, he'd be going into the ring without the man who had transformed him from a bully to a first-class boxer. He needed somebody that could be with him every day. Arnie Beam had spent most every day with Lennox since the boy arrived in Canada from London at age 13. Nearly a decade later, Beam lost his day job for devoting too much time to training and traveling with the prodigy. I was paying the rent for the gym out of my pocket. Because I lost my job, I had to give up that gym. Lennox says his mentor started drinking to excess. At certain times, we get phone calls in the middle of the night, you know, Arnie's down there, you know, we need to sort him out. I have a talk with Arnie. I told him, you can't be looking after the boys and drinking, that you're not setting a good example. Beam had helped hire a coach for the Canadian national team, Adrian Tedesco. He sent Lennox to train with his friend Egerton Marcus in Toronto. In the Olympic Training Center, training with Adrian and training with sparring with, with better opposition, it picked his game up. I missed him, but, but he never lost track of me. He never forgot about me. Lennox arrived in Seoul, South Korea the following summer, determined to make his patience pay off in gold. He cruised into the medal bout against the favorite, American Riddick Foe. Foe got the best of him in round one. Second round, realizing that he cannot win the fight the way it was going, he just physically overpowered our American heavyweight. Lewis screaming at him in the corner, and Lewis has come out inspired. The referee stopped the fight in round two. And the winner is Lennox. Call me that night. And he said, Arnie, that right hand was for you. I said, yeah, good. I said, but I have a question. He said, what's that? I said, what took you so long? <laughs> Four years of blood, sweat, and tears had finally brought Lennox Olympic gold. He came back home. He had the medal. And all I could think of is four years before that when he'd come back home from the L.A. Olympics. And he said, I'm going to win. I'm going to win the gold medal. Then move on from there. Lennox a hero's welcome. But Lennox's adopted homeland had no big-time boxing promoters. Either he's going to go to the U.S. or to Britain. The Americans control the belts. You know, nobody else really can control the belts. But I'm saying, boxing started in England. I remember him saying to me, if he goes to Britain, he gets to be the big fish. Lennox Lewis was going home on his own terms. He signed a revolutionary contract with London promoter Frank Maloney. Lennox's take of each fight would be a whopping 70%. They had to house him, and all the training expenses and everything else come out of the management's 30%. Lennox demanded veto power over trainers and opponents. He even negotiated a salary for his mother, who quit her assembly line job after 17 years. He wanted to make sure when it came to his life that he was in control. Lewis's return to London was hardly a homecoming. There was, I would call it indifference, especially from the mainstream press. In some places, outright antagonism towards Lennox because they didn't... They had this thing that he wasn't British. Being in Canada, they say, I sound British. Being over here, they say, I sound American. So I can't really win. 
I said to myself, you know, when I'm heavyweight champion of the world, who's going to claim me? Lennox let his hands do the talking. He went 14-0 and with 12 knockouts. Even so, British fans ignored him in favor of Frank Bruno, a former European champion on the downside of his career. They built Frank Bruno with the media. To get to Bruno, Lennox first had to square off against British champion Gary Mason, rated number four in the world. Nobody's quite sure who's going to make the fight. This was a must-win fight for Lennox. Lennox entered the ring a heavy underdog. Something to think about. The way he fought that fight was... Uh, with his jab, and it was just it's amazing to see. Lewis' left hand finds its way very easily into the face of Gary Mason. He jabbed Mason's head off. Lennox Lewis, he proved himself a better man on this night. The Mason fight made Lennox a legitimate contender for the heavyweight crown. The British press was less than impressed. It was hard to get newspapers and television stations to come to Lennox Lewis press conferences. A master tactician in and out of the ring, Lewis plotted a campaign to gain respect and get a shot at the title. Once you beat him, you know, he will always try and revenge any defeat that he has. That's part of his character. In November of 91, Lennox stepped back into the ring with Terrell Biggs, the man who had spoiled his first Olympic bid. The following fall, he faced off against Razor Ruddock, who had handed Lennox his first amateur defeat. The winner would get a shot at the undisputed heavyweight crown. When we stepped in the ring, I just rushed him and mulled him. <laughs> Razor. That was it. Lennox Lewis of London is headed uptown. His high school girlfriend, Marcia Miller, had been by his side for every victory. Closing in on his first title bout, he gave her a diamond ring. Lennox had managed his career and life to near perfection, but he could not have predicted heavyweight champ Riddick Bowe's next move. Bo didn't want to fight him. Well, didn't want to lose. Initially, the two sides could not come to terms for a title fight. By the time Lennox relented and offered to take the deal, Bo refused. Lennox wants his belt, then we'll be calling him the goddess pick. That was his way of getting out of the fight with Lennox Lewis because he knew he was cruising for a loser. The World Boxing Council took Lennox's side, stripping Bo of his belt and awarding it to Lennox. He learned of the WBC's decision while vacationing in Jamaica. First, he locked up in his room, you know, and moping about it. That's the most I've ever seen an agitated body, anything. It's just the inability to get that fight. He's willing to, you know, duck and dive. I'll wait for him. He's got the belt, but he hasn't got the acclaim that goes with winning the belt. Lennox Lewis was the champion. By default, Riddick Bowe was the first fighter from his past to run and hide, but he would not be the last. When Mike Tyson refused to fight him and gave up his championship, it was just a, a really crushing blow for Lennox. I know it does eat away at him, but what can he do? Lennox Lewis became the first British-born boxer to wear the heavyweight crown in more than a century. But it had been handed to him on a silver platter. He had fought his way to the title, but not actually won it in the ring. It was no fault of Lennox that Riddick Bowe decided to throw this belt into the bin. The former champ had refused to fight, and for that, Riddick Bowe was publicly ridiculed. Lennox was undefeated, but he wasn't even the most admired boxer in Great Britain, much less the world. The great British hope at that point had been Frank Bruner, and he'd been built up into a national icon. British people loved the loser. You know, if you lose, they, they just loved you even more. 
October of 93, Lennox gave the great British hope a shot at the WBC belt. Now uh, I think they've uh, accepted me. Lewis in trouble in the corner. And lands a sensational left hook. Which they should have in the beginning because I was always British. Amazing, the Bruno stands up. And now Mickey Band stops the fight. He had proven himself to Great Britain, but his life plan was on the ropes. His romance with Marcia was falling apart. The constant pressure of the public eye had been too much for the relationship to bear. That winter, the wedding plans were called off. You know, we were pretty uh, thick-headed, both of us. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of different people around us, you know, telling us different things. So we kind of, like, grew apart. Marcia was not in the crowd when Lennox fought a relative nobody. Oliver McCall. I was throwing a punch. He was throwing a punch at the same time. I got caught with it. What is this? I can't believe what I just saw. For the first time as a pro, Lennox tasted defeat. His reign as champ was over. But there were, of course, those that called him to his to question his right to have ever been champion. Lennox actually turned to us and said, listen, why are you all sad? It was like a weight was lifted off my shoulder, you know, a burden, you know, all of a sudden, okay, I slipped, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not perfect. He lifted everybody up in that room and we all got up and said, right, let's go, let's get out there. Ever patient. Lennox shied away from the spotlight and waited for a chance to win a title in the ring. And waited for a chance to win a title in the ring. Lennox Lewis has very little concern, uh, put any value on showboating. He's only concerned about the results and boxing. At the other end of the spectrum was his old sparring partner, Mike Tyson. In 1996, Iron Mike was fresh out of prison. After serving time for rape, he crushed Frank Bruno for the WBC belt. The new British hope was next in line. Mike Tyson refused to fight Lennox Lewis, much like Riddick Bowe. That was a huge disappointment for Lennox, even though he got financially compensated. Promoter Don King negotiated a deal to prevent a title bout between Tyson and Lewis. The WBC ordered Tyson to give up his belt and pay Lewis $4 million. Round one begins. Lennox took out his frustration on the one man who had beaten him. The winner of McCall Lewis would take the belt Tyson had given up. Lennox dominated from the start, but was floored by McCall at the end of the fourth round. Jim, I think this fight should be stopped right now. I was thinking, I was prepared for everything, but definitely not prepared for a man breaking down in the ring and crying. I couldn't believe what I was watching. He's crying in his corner. I've never seen anything like this. Lennox was awarded the victory when McCall refused to continue. Twice he had won a hollow championship after twice being ducked by the opponent he'd sought. He kind of accepts it because that's the fate that he's been dealt. But inside I wonder if it doesn't like eat away at him because every time he comes to get his, his accolades, at time, his time of greatness, something happens, some weirdness happens. In a sport built on hype and public taunting, the two-time champ was labeled boring by some sports writers. Others speculated on his private life. The fact that he hasn't flaunted girlfriends, people get totally the wrong impression. He's chosen to be private. He, he does get wild up about that, and I told him not to worry about that, because everybody who knows, he knows he's not gay. He's, he's, a, he's a man that loves women, you know. I was involved in a relationship, so I wasn't really out there, you know, playing around. 
I've gone after the career first, and you know, after the career is finished, I'll go after the family aspect. In March of 99, Lennox got his first real chance at unfinished business. 12 rounds of boxing for the young... He stepped into the ring with three-time world champion Evander Holyfield. At stake, the undisputed heavyweight title. You know, he just destroyed Mike Tyson in two fights. He was even predicting a third-round knockout. Only three men left in the ring. That God is ordained him to knock Lennox out the third round. In the first two rounds, Lennox kept Holyfield at bay with his reach. Lewis using his long arms to hand off Holyfield. The entire crowd in Madison Square Garden was all waiting for the third round for Banner to come out and fulfill the prophecy. By the fifth round, Holyfield was hunted in danger of going down. Holyfield, after a certain point of the fight, just gave up trying to fight. Holyfield now seems to be just waiting for the bell to ring. What was supposed to be Lennox Lewis's crowning achievement. The decision is even a draw. Both champions retain their belt. Became another black eye for the fight game. And another crushing blow for Lennox Lewis, Great Britain's greatest boxer. How judges could have come up with that as a draw? Is still beyond. Although considering Lennox Lewis's history, it should not have been a surprise. His homeland hardly claimed him. Every triumph had been tarnished. They ripped me off, yes. You know, the whole world can see I won the fight and I am the best. So when they ask who the best heavyweight in the world, it doesn't matter who's got the belts, they're going to say Lennox Lewis. He would get a chance to prove that boast against his oldest rival. In the fall of 1999, Lennox Lewis had the sporting world on his side for the first time in his life. He had battered a heavyweight legend into submission, only to come away with a draw. It was almost an international incident. It was even a talk that British fighters or British sportsmen shouldn't go to America again because, you know, how can we get results like this? They're just totally unjust. The uproar helped force a rematch. This time, the decision for Lennox Lewis was bittersweet. The first fight, everybody said, oh, you should have knocked him out. Then I'm going in the second fight trying to knock him out, and that's another mistake. You know, it just makes me look down. When he feels that he's fighting somebody that's in danger, that's good. He goes to another level. I don't think he'll ever lose to a quality fighter. He'll only lose to guys when he's relaxed. The heavyweight champ relaxed against another relative nobody, Hasim Rockman, in April of 2001. Like his rematch with McCall, Lewis had no trouble avenging the defeat. By age 36, he had beaten every man brave enough to face him. In 2002, Tyson would take the fight he had refused six years before. At the press conference in New York, Mike just went for the... As he had done to Holyfield in the ring, Iron Mike attacked with his teeth. Mike hit him on the leg. Lennox says, well, whenever I hear him on TV saying he wants to eat me, so I have to take him seriously. for that one. And he just laughed at it. But the brawl almost sabotaged the fight. Tyson was banned from boxing in Las Vegas and New York. The last misfit in heavyweight boxing, it would be a great shame not to be able to keep him the whipping. The former sparring partners would finally square off in Memphis, 19 years after first meeting. Hi, from the pyramid in Memphis, it's time! It's almost like an alley fight for about the first minute. <laughs> Lewis remembers the lesson from long ago. The game plan was definitely for Lennox to test Mike and let Mike fight himself. Take shots from the outside. Tie him up when he gets too close. Get out, get out. As the fight progressed, I was more concerned about the referee than I was about Mike Tyson. Eddie Cotton took away a point from Lewis after the fourth for hitting Tyson in the back on his way to the canvas. I had a feeling that the referee was trying 
to find a reason to save Mike Tyson at any cost, even if it meant disqualifying Lewis Lewis. The Lewis camp had come to expect the worst from the fight camp. Not this time. Boxing's gentleman champion tamed the monster, Iron Mike. After the fight, Lennox said that little boy I was in the room with when we were kids together, he came out again. There is nothing left for Lennox Lewis to prove. All that remains is a record of his glory and a debate about his legacy. I would love for history to just speak it the way it is. Reality, I mean, I'm basically making my history. My problem is will they write it down correctly? <laughs>